Are you impressed with God? If you're not impressed with God, what's it going to take to impress you? You're a hard person to impress. When we think about who God is, his very nature, his power, his ability to be everywhere all at once and know everything there is to know. And yet he's chosen to know, chosen to know you. And he wants us to know him in a relational way. That's a pretty amazing thing. He's our father. He could have chosen to be known by many other things. And there are some other descriptive terms. But primarily, he's our father. That's certainly not accidental. It does remind us of very important earthly connections that breeds trust and comfort and direction. And we are so grateful uh, for our physical fathers who bless our lives so much. And God bless each and every one of you today. But we rejoice as well that we have a father in heaven. There are some 250 references to God as Father in the New Testament. About 170 of those come from the mouth of Jesus himself. Who better to introduce us to our Father than Jesus? The only begotten of the Father. John 1:14, 1, 1 John 4 and verse 9. In a sense, he is uniquely qualified to make the family introductions so that all of us might know him better. Appreciate him in a sense as the Bible says, our elder brother, and for him to tell us about our father. In Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 46, while he was still talking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and brothers stood outside seeking to speak with him and then one said to him, look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak with you. But he answered and said to the one who told him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand toward his disciples and said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Earthly relationships, while important, bow to the ultimate importance of the spiritual relationship that we have within the family of God. Jesus wanted everyone to understand that. He wasn't being disrespectful to his family. But he's just trying to get everybody to understand there is a bigger picture here. There's something far more significant that needs to be considered. And it's one that's, that's important for us today. Because we're talking about something that is not bound to this world's parameters, but rather reaches into the beyond, into, into heaven itself, into eternity. And that gets us excited. It's also the greatest comfort of the world when we see family members here uh, who pass from this earth. To see a life lived for Christ and to have the hope of the gospel, to know that they are part of the greater family that goes beyond now, that's an awesome thing. It's interesting to me as well that the Apostle Paul begins every single one of his letters. Don't miss that. Every single one of his letters. By referencing God the Father. Now that can't be accidental. Now we all have certain writing styles. Certain words we might use. Certain vocabulary that maybe distinguishes us from someone else. But when we think about the, the Holy Spirit inspiring these words, think about how critical it is 
that every single congregation of the Lord's church in the first century, every person that Paul was intimately aware of that he was addressing, he wanted them to know from the outset about God the Father. Because he knew how motivational that would be. He knew how important that would be in their dire circumstances to be able to trust in somebody who loved them, who was invested in them. Frequently it's expressed this way, grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We're his children. Listen to these exciting verses. Romans 8 verse 15 begins, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, join heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons or children of God. That's an awesomely exciting passage. Think about the family that we are in because God chose us to be able to be in the family. Gave us the opportunity. Allows us through our response to be added to the church, the body, the family. And to know of the the glory of that. And the long lasting nature of it. The sufferings of this present time. Hey, not worthy to be compared, as significant though they may be, with the glory which shall be revealed in us. 1 John 3, 1 and 2, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are the children of God. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. I think I did this once before, but let me share with you how I see this text. Don't get scared or anything. Behold! You're glad I warned you, right? Behold! Well, I don't care what follows that. Everybody's going to pay attention. Right? I think that's the very thing that's meant here. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. That's how awesome it is and marvelous it is and wondrous it is. This isn't a casual proclamation. This is something that changes everything. We are the children of God now, but concerning the future, we we ain't seen nothing yet. Heaven could be viewed as a nonstop homecoming. Those not in the family will not be able to attend. Summers are big times for Family homecomings when cousins and fourth cousins twice removed. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> but anyway, you know, all these extended families who come together for a great event and you see people you hadn't seen in a long time, but there's one qualification. You've got to be a member of the family. We don't find that unusual. I don't show up to your family reunion. You don't show up to mine. Because we know we're not qualified. We don't have the ancestry of that. What makes us think 
That we can be at the greatest homecoming of all in heaven one day if we're not part of the family. John 1, 11 to 13, he came to his own and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. To those who believe in his name who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now that's the reality of being born. We're, we're, we're so thrilled with the birth of little ones in our congregation. What an outstanding thing, and we're excited about that. But this is talking about something even more special, as hard as that is to fathom. Born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. John 3, 3 to 5, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You can't go to the family reunion. It is essential when we think about the choice that we make with our lives to know that with all the decisions we have to make, this is the decision. Everything bows down in importance to this particular choice. But if we are born of God, then you ought to be able to see the family resemblance. Now, we're not God. We're not close to God. We are far from God. We're imperfect. We're sinful. We're stubborn. All the things that humans can be, we, we are. But yet in Christ, we can resemble the one that we need to be like. And we can be called godly people because we can emulate the characteristics to the best of our imperfect ability that our Father sets forth in a perfect way. I don't know how many times this past week, many of you know Susan and my dad's in the hospital. Doing better, we're grateful for that. I want to tell you something. I can't deny who I am. Somebody walks in the room. Okay, now who, oh, wait a minute. You're a, you're a son, right? I said, yeah. I mean, I'm not bothered by that, but I, we resemble one another. I have physical attributes that are similar to his, as does Susan. But when we think about the daily situation of life, we need to strive to, to be like our Father in heaven. Ephesians 5, 8, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Ephesians 4, 32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. Chapter 5, verse 1, be imitators of God as dear children. And in 1 Peter 1, 13, beginning, therefore gird up the loins of your mind to be sober. Rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, so also be holy in all your conduct, because it's written, be holy for I am holy. And if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. We, of course, cannot achieve the perfection or his distinctive majesty but through the conduct of our efforts, 
what we consider important. May others look at us and say, you remind me of your father. There is no greater compliment than that for the child of God. That's it. Sometimes as his children, we need to be reminded that we can come home. The story of the prodigal son is one of the most familiar and touching lessons from the lips of Jesus. When we look at the story, our focus is usually upon the son and his failures and his eventual reconciliation with his father. But think about how God our Father is presented in the face of that earthly father of long ago. Luke 15 tells us the story, the younger son leaves and goes into that far country and wastes everything he has. He squanders the the gift, the inheritance that the father had given him. For some indefinite period of time, he's disconnected from home. And when he left home, one of the things he left behind was the broken heart of his father. Because when the son one day decided to come home, It was the father who saw him a great way off and ran, yes, ran to meet him. Luke 15, 20, when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. The son then wanting to come home and be reconciled to home again to the grace that he knew was there in his father's household. He expresses his regrets at what he should have done and shouldn't have done. But keep this in mind, and it gives us insight into the mind of our father. He saw him when he was looking, because he was looking for him. He ran to him because he loved him. And he kissed him because he wanted him to know of that love. Ah, I missed you so much. So glad you're home. Verse 21, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy that he be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. We are not worthy to be God's children. None of us. We're not worthy of that. And yet he says, here, try this on. Put this robe on. We're not worthy to to be his children. He said, but yeah, eat this feast in your honor. I've, I've wasted, I've sinned, I've messed up God. I'm just... Father, I've embarrassed the family name. I'm just, yeah, I know, I know. Here, wear this ring. Signifying that you're part of me. It's not a matter of worthiness. It's a matter of grace, love, and family. This young man manifested the right attitude. Penitence needed? Oh, yeah. Of course. He expresses that. But the father wanted him to know. That I love you. And this is home. If you want to be home... This is your home. The tragic thing in the world is for there to be a home and yet not wanting to have it. Now, to divert just for a moment, homelessness is a problem in our nation and in the world. We need to do what we can to try to provide homes for people where that is possible and to assist in that process. Homelessness is is a, a blight on any civilization, any community. But having said that, let me make the point I want to make spiritually. There ought to be nobody who's homeless spiritually.
Because God the Father says, here, here, come on in. Come on in. I will adopt you as my child through the choice that you make to put Christ on in baptism for the forgiveness of sins. You wander away as the prodigal did. Places your soul in eternal jeopardy, no doubt. But just know something, you can come home anytime you want to. Here's the door. Come in, please. You'll find love here. You'll find forgiveness here. And by the way, brethren, that's what church is supposed to be. Church is supposed to be that kind of family. Who accepts those who are added enthusiastically and welcomes those who are added back, so to speak. God is my Father. It is in that relationship that my present and my future is fixed. Do you need to respond today to this most holy of fathers? Can we help you as we stand and sing?